All right, so um, hi everyone, hi Angie Poland, welcome to my session, Dissecting Dependency Injection in Angular and NSJS. And before diving into this topic, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Kamel, I'm a co-founder of Trinal.io, the next level software consulting company, and I'm a full stack software engineer primarily focused on the web related things. I'm also a Google developer expert in Angular and web technologies. So you can find me on Twitter uh, using this highlighted Twitter handle and obviously on GitHub. Beyond regular day-to-day -day work, I'm giving the value back to the community as an open source contributor. I'm the creator of Nest.js, which is the fastest growing, the fastest rising framework for Node.js in 2018. In the last year, we have noted almost 300% growth in the number of GitHub stocks, leaving behind any other existing Node.js HTTP library, including all those famous ones like Express, Koa, and HappyJS. Regarding Nest, maybe let's start with a quick question. Who has heard about Nest.js already? Please write your hand. Awesome. Who's using Nest.js? Please write your hand once again. All right, so you have like 15% of people, maybe 10% of people. All right, you can do better next year. All right, so just to give you a short overview and ensure that everyone is on the same page. This framework is written entirely in TypeScript and is heavily inspired by Angular, taking what's best in Angular and reflecting it in a Node.js ecosystem to allow people building a wide range of services and applications in a similar fashion as in Angular. But today I'm not going to talk about Nest.js specifically. In particular, if you're interested, you can visit our website, nestjs.com. You can follow us on Twitter if you use Twitter. Our Twitter handle is Nest Framework. Instead, today, I will dig into the feature that overlaps between Nest.js and Angular, which name is Dependency Injection. Dependency Injection is an important application design pattern. It helps us creating flexible, scalable, and testable systems. And both Angular and Nest.js have their own Dependency Injection frameworks behind. Let's consider this simple example. We have a regular cat service class, just a normal TypeScript JavaScript class that makes use of two different dependencies, respectively HTTP service and logger. Both are immediately instantiated within the body of the class, which means that every time when the object of this class is created, it will also create nested objects, and this is kind of obvious. And we already know that this approach is not very maintainable, not really testable, and makes creation of comprehensive software tougher over time. Hence, both frameworks supply us with a dependency injection mechanism. Now, our class asks for dependencies from external sources rather than creating them by itself inside the body of the class. The question that we should ask ourselves is, how is that even possible that either Angular or Nest.js knows that we want to inject HTTP service at position number one and logger at position number two? How is it possible? Is injectable decorator a reason? Yes and no at the same time. The decorator is going to add the, the metadata information, information to our transpile class to ensure that the type information to identify the tokens is not lost. No, nonetheless, it's not going to enable dependency injection by itself. Being honest, the body of this function could even look like this. Just a simple function without anything inside. No logic, zero lines of code. It's enough. It's not the case anymore, though, in both frameworks, because we can pass an options object which consists of provided in attribute if you want to register a provided in NestJS. Um, we have a scope property in order to set a scope and so on and so forth. But basically, this is everything that we need in order to get a class constructor information at runtime. So as I said, the entire dependency injection mechanism in TypeScript all boils down to the metadata, or even to say it more precisely, to the metadata produced by the TypeScript compiler. Basically, TypeScript compiler is able to emit some design time, serialized type metadata. Let's have a look at this class once again. This is what will end up in our final bundle after the TypeScript compilation process. As you can see, various things are happening around cat service class. We've got two helper utility functions generated by the compiler, respectively decorate and metadata, and they are usually located at the beginning of each file. They are doing some usual things underneath, like checking whether you have a reflect object on the global scope, and depending on that, they will assign this metadata in different ways. However, the most important here is this part. So design param types is a TypeScript metadata key used for parameter metadata. And regardless whether you interact with a constructor or a normal meta, the same key is being used. We'll always use design param types. The second argument is an array that contains references to classes that are needed in this particular context. 
So we could say that this metadata was kind of extracted from the constructor at the compilation time. Taking a step back to our class, we already know that this metadata exists at the runtime. How can we take advantage of that? So TypeScript gives us a polyfill, a metadata reflection API, which enables us to put some meta programming on top of JavaScript. And it's all about providing a consistent, simple, straightforward approach to reason over metadata. Using metadata reflection API, we can get constructor param types if we put design param types, so this dedicated string as a first parameter, and our class as a second one. You can see that if we call reflect get metadata, we pass the design parameters as the first parameter and cut cells as the second parameter, it's going to return us an array of types that we can use to indicate what dependencies are actually required in the cut cells class. And now things become very simple. Let's imagine that we have an inquirer. In our case, cut service that needs two dependencies. It goes to injector. Injector asks for both dependencies by type. And the container is a simple collection in which in which keys are equal to type references, whereas corresponding values are instances of these types. And then the container returns the value to injector, and injector is able to create an instance of our class. But obviously, it's just a simplification. It's just a high-level view how you could theoretically implement dependency injection system in your, in your systems. Because frameworks like Angular and SGS, we have to do some heavy lifting underneath, um, solving circular dependencies, resolving asynchronous providers, and so on. And so forth. All right, uh, let's have a look at how the frameworks deal with TypeScript design time metadata. Nest is using this API directly, so there's nothing to explain. It's the same as in the normal TypeScript compilation. We don't have any dedicated compiler. We don't perform any post-processing. But if you dive into the files generated by the Angular compiler, you will see something like this. It is still the same output with a one small difference. Both utility functions are imported from TSLib. Now, Nettles. If we move to the ng factory file of Angular and Angular component, we'll see that the dependencies are represented in a slightly different way. This is an instruction generated by the Angular A compiler. We have a homepage component here and two constructor dependencies, change detector ref and router. So as you can see, Angular performs some post-processing, has additional compilation steps, this Angular compiler, which no longer uses design param types, this dedicated string, string for a few reasons, actually. Most importantly, though, because of the performance, because of the first meaningful pain to ensure that the bundle of your application is as small as possible. In the next IV renderer, which is coming in the Angular 9, we don't have legacy ng factories anymore represented as additional files. Instead, this is what the compiler will produce us. Here you can see two dependencies that have to be injected into a homepage component. Compiler hard codes these dependencies inside a factory function, inside a JavaScript function, so this reflect metadata, this polyfill, is not needed anymore. It would be too good if everything was so simple. Of course it's not, because there are problems down the road which you may face very often. First of all, let's talk about interfaces, interfaces available in TypeScript. This is our previous example. We are going to switch from HTTP service class to the AI HTTP service interface. And regardless of the naming conventions, I personally do not use I for each interface name, but I've used I HTTP service just to clearly indicate that we are interacting with an interface right now instead of a class. Now let's reflect our constructor metadata once again. And as you can see, if we call reflect get metadata, we pass the same sort of parameters as before, it turns out that we have an object. Instead of having some kind of metadata about I HTTP service, we've got a regular object type. And this type does not bring any useful value. The reason is obvious. Interfaces do not exist in a vanilla JavaScript, and therefore TypeScript is not able to provide us with useful information about I HTTP service. We cannot distinguish interfaces, and that's why you cannot use them in both Angular and SGS for dependency injection purposes. What is the potential solution for this problem? The first potential solution would be TypeScript compiler, at some point in the future, would leave some additional metadata or interfaces that we could then use at the runtime. It might be difficult, though, because we don't know how to represent interfaces in a JavaScript because interfaces do not exist in this language. As a string, as a symbol, as a constant value, that would affect a bundle. So the second potential solution would be to use ASC, abstract syntax tree, to statically analyze our code and enhance TypeScript compiler, run a plugin on, run on top of it, and save the store this custom metadata somewhere and then we can read it, read it at runtime. Another difficulty, generics. 
Again, let's have a look at our cut service class. We'll change the second dependency to the data source repository class, just like that. So now we have our repository, repository of a cut entity. Let's dive into the metadata stuff once again. And you can see that if we call reflect your metadata, again, with the same set of parameters, um, the metadata is now equal to an array with HTTP service, order was preserved, everything is, uh, everything is right. The second parameter, uh, the second um, element in the array is a repository. What about cat class? You can see that we lose knowledge about specializations. And again, a kind of reason is obvious, because generics do not exist in JavaScript. And the potential solution will be the same as before. So type compiler at some point in the future will have to save um, the metadata about generics that have been used in this particular context. Or we can write an ASC plugin that will run on top of the compiler and store this metadata manually. And now let's challenge. Circular dependencies. Let's say that we have a cat service, which for some reason depends on a dog service, and also dog service, which also depends on a cat service. So we can clearly see we have a circular dependency here. Now let's use this value fill called reflect the metadata, pass the same set of parameters, and as you can see, metadata is now equal to an array with a one single element which is equal to undefined. Instead of having type reference, instead of having a reference to dog service, we have undefined. The problem is that one class in JavaScript has to be defined, always has to be defined first, um, because classes are actually functions, and thus the second one will be presented as undefined. In order to solve this problem, both Angular and NestJS provide a helper function called forward reference, which creates an indirect reference that a framework can resolve later. How complicated it is? Oh, well, it's super simple. It's function that saves, stores your function behind a dedicated key. Then the framework, which knows the key, can use the key to get the reference to the type lazy. And that's it. All right, we know how the metadata is being handled at the language level. Let's talk about injector trees now. Both Angular and NestJS dependency injection systems are hierarchical. Whereas Angular has a platform, ng module level, component level injectors, which are named as element injectors. Nest has only one type of injector, a module level injector. Let's take a look at Angular structure. When Angular creates a component C, which relies on a C provider, it will firstly look up component's own injector. If the component injector lacks the provider, it passes the request up to its parent component injector. If this injector cannot satisfy the request, request keep bounding up until Angular finds, um, finds its provider somewhere, and eventually it will hit global root scope, so every, the disk scope in which you have all these providers registered using provided in the root, and pick C from there if it wasn't overriding at any level. Let's move to the injectors in NestJS now. As I said a few slides earlier, Nest has only module level injectors. Generally, module form a directed graph data structure. All relations might be either bidirectional or unidirectional with unique edges for each direction. Each vertex is, represents a single module. It leads us to a conclusion that each module is a singleton, which is partially true, but it's not always the case, because in SGS we have dynamic modules, in Angular we have module with providers. Either way, each module has its own injector. Also, each module has its API, which acts like a facade. In Angular, exports array is being used to export components, directives, pipe declarations, basically. In SGS, on the other hand, we use it to export providers. It means that only exclusively exported things can be accessed outside of the module. If module registers a provider but does not export it, then it will be encapsulated inside and not accessible for any other module. When Nest is trying to resolve your dependency, it will firstly look up a provider within a one module. Even if a dependency exists in one of these modules, Nest would not be able to use it unless they are explicitly exported by the host module. So it's a part of the exports array. This is how the encapsulation isolation works in NestJS. And why I'm saying that? Because it's completely different as in Angular. Even though the dependency injection system are very similar to each other and the um, high-level API looks almost the same, this is a very crucial difference. Additionally, Nest also allows you overriding providers at different levels. For instance, if both these two gold injectors contain a provider with the same token, Nest will always use this provider, which has been defined closer to the inquirer. What does it mean? 
Let's say that in the application module we have a user service, and we also have a user service in the users module. If I want to inject user service within the application module scope, Nest will always use this one defined closer to the inquirer, so this one which exists in the application module scope, because the diff distance between the scope to application module is zero, whereas the distance from application to users is one. Even though Nest is very strict regarding isolation levels, there is still a way to create some sort of a global scope which would work almost the same as the Angular. If you change your module, for instance, core module, this one in the uh, corner to a global one, which goes down to adding one single decorator, global decorator, that's it, Nest will create virtual edges to this module from each existing module. Nevertheless, even global module has to explicitly export providers and thus make them publicly available for everyone. One last thing before the end of the talk. I would like to say that Nest.js is open source. We right now have more than 21,000 stars on GitHub, and we are totally driven by the community. And therefore, I encourage everyone who shares similar ideas to join this little revolution. We would love for you to contribute to Nest and help make it even better than it is today. Also, if you or your company are looking for help with either Angular or Node, or maybe you are migrate, migrating towards Nest.js, let us know, send us a message. We offer full stack consulting, helping teams with anything from front end to back end development. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for having me.